I sail an ocean, unsettled ocean, through restful waters and deep commotion, often frightened, unenlightened. Sail on, sail on, sail on. Hello, I'm Dr. Gary Onick, your host for Cancer is Tough, But You Are Tougher. I want to thank the Beach Boys for allowing us to use their music, which is dear to my heart. This podcast is uniquely personal. I am both a cancer specialist as well as a cancer survivor. It's a rare person who isn't touched by cancer in some way or another. Let this podcast be an encouraging resource and ultimately bring you hope. Stop the crying and the lying and the sighing and my dying. Sail on, sail on, sail on. Hello, I'm Dr. Gary Onick. Um, I'm an interventional oncologist in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I'm here to discuss with you the five things I think you need to know uh, to survive cancer. The first is you have to find an oncologist that you feel comfortable with and can be your advocate. I just had a patient uh, come to me who had stage four breast cancer, and she came to us for our immunotherapy protocol. Uh, This immunotherapy protocol is in an FDA study and has uh, literature associated with it. So it is not, um, you know, a fly-by-night, uh, treatment she was going to go to um, in Tijuana, for instance, uh, you know, it's a credible um, alternative for her situation. She was told she had uh, nine months to uh, to live, and uh, she wanted to explore other options. She went to her oncologist, and. Uh, proposed that she wanted to um, have this treatment. Her oncologist uh, took the point of view that, number one, this treatment would kill her, although she knew nothing about the treatment at all. Uh, She wouldn't discuss the treatment, wouldn't call us, uh, didn't want any of the literature that we had uh, about the treatment, and that uh, basically if uh, she went for this, uh, that she would be uh, removing herself from this patient's care. This is uh, a sociopathic uh, oncologist. Um, in uh, probably the most extreme example uh, I can give, but there are various gradations. Uh, of this type of situation. You need to find an oncologist that will be your advocate, that will keep an open mind to the uh, alternatives that you will bring to him or her uh, and uh, investigate them and help you decide whether they are a reasonable alternative. No matter what the reputation of the oncologist that you Uh, first meet, if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't like that person, then go find uh, another alternative. If your potential uh, doctor is touted uh, in his or her promotional literature to being the world's expert in some particular treatment, uh, might be true, uh, but what you need to do is you need to look into the medical literature, the peer-reviewed literature, and find out what the results are. If they are nowhere to be found in the medical literature, then there's usually a reason. And uh, any credible expert in the field will certainly uh, look toward uh, placing their results in peer-reviewed uh, uh, literature. There is a, a TED talk from 
uh, a physician by the name of uh, Abraham Verges, V-E-R-G-H-E-S-E. And he relates the story of a woman that he saw in uh, an emergency room uh, who was uh, having uh, pulmonary problems. He's an infectious disease uh, doctor. And uh, when he examined her, he found a very large uh, breast tumor. It turns out that up until this point, that patient had never been actually examined, had never had a physician's hands placed on her. In the uh, rest of the TED Talk, Dr. Vergase talks about the um, healing and comforting quality of uh, having a physician place uh, his hands uh, on you. Uh, this also extends to uh, an oncologist listening to their patients. I learned the most important information about a patient's condition from just listening to them. Well, your oncologist has limited time uh, with each patient. That's just the way of medicine um, uh, in its current state right now. You should be able to uh, voice your problems and concerns uh, without being uh, constantly uh, interrupted. Number two. Uh, number two, take responsibility for your care. Do research, ask questions, find a course of treatment you feel comfortable with. And you want uh, an oncologist with an open mind who will uh, be your advocate and fight for you. There's a wonderful book by Vincent DeVita, who is one of the most famous uh, oncologists uh, in the world. He was the head of the National Cancer in for Institute for many years. And uh, in his book, The Death of Cancer, uh, he tells the story of his friend who had metastatic prostate cancer. At the time, the only treatment for metastatic prostate cancer was physical castration. And uh, even with that rather extreme treatment, uh, his friend uh, had a very limited uh, lifespan. However, Dr. DeVita's philosophy was to pull out all the stops and try whatever might make scientific sense even if it hadn't been used for that particular disease. What was interesting was that Dr. DeVita met resistance every step of the way from the oncology establishment that was taking care of his patient. Against the odds, he kept that friend alive for an additional uh, 10 years. So you can imagine if the most famous oncologist, perhaps in history, met resistance in treating his friend outside of the usual protocols and pathways that are established in oncology, you're going to have to be uh, pretty uh, focused and dedicated uh, to uh, follow. Uh, the right path, and to uh, be your own uh, advocate. This was also illustrated by uh, a story related to me recently in one of our podcasts by a friend of mine, a uh, doctor by the name of Howie Friedman. Howie was uh, a young resident in ophthalmology at Washington University in St. Louis. And he uh, was diagnosed with stage three Hodgkin's disease, which at that point was uh, pretty much a death sentence. He went to the oncologist in his institution and uh, said, what should I do? Where should I go? And the oncologist uh, there basically said, stay here. We know um, and treat uh, Hodgkin's disease all the time. And uh, 
uh, can't do better than this. What was interesting was that uh, Howie went ahead and did his own research and called uh, heads of departments and uh, he actually had a friend at the National Cancer Institute and asked them uh, where he should go. And they said, definitely want to go to Stanford because they have a new protocol that seems to be uh, uh, excellent and providing uh, you know, some cures for patients. As it turned out, it was the protocol that Vincent DeVita had uh, proposed for uh, Hodgkin's disease as well. So uh, despite the fact that uh, the oncologist at Washington University uh, said he could treat Howard, um, uh, he wasn't going to treat him with that protocol, and how he went to Stanford, was treated and was cured, and was disease-free for almost 40 years. Let me tell you one more story related to this. Um, I had a patient with metastatic prostate cancer, and he responded very well to our treatment, but not completely. And he went and did his uh, own research and brought to us uh, a new treatment for prostate cancer, uh, which at the time was only available in certain protocols in the United States in terms of research, and he would not have been a candidate for those protocols. So uh, he found a physician in Europe who was willing to treat him with this uh, experimental treatment called Hutesium-177. He went, had that treatment. I looked at uh, the literature and I looked at uh, uh, the treatment and the person who was going to be providing the treatment. And I said, you know, looks like a reasonable uh, alternative. Uh, go ahead, follow that up, and we'll have other alternatives for you if it uh, doesn't pan out. So he did go, and he did wonderfully uh, with that treatment. Subsequent to that, now that we knew about that, that treatment, taught to us by one of our patients, we have sent a number of other patients uh, to that uh, treatment who have done uh, extremely well. So your physician should listen to you. Um, and uh, take your suggestions and uh, help you research them and uh, advocate them if he thinks that it's a reasonable thing to do. Let's talk a little bit about clinical trials. Clinical trials are essential to pushing forward the boundaries of oncology. There are a number of instances uh, in the past where uh, clinical trial was the uh, first time a breakthrough medication was used and, and saved the lives uh, miraculously of people in the trial. So that is always a possibility. And if you're talking about a new medication that uh, has never been used before with a unique uh, application uh, and a unique uh, formula, then it's perfectly reasonable with uh, your consultation with your oncologist to uh, pursue a clinical trial like that. Uh, not all clinical trials are of that sort, and uh, there may be clinical trials uh, where you can actually use the medications that are being tested without being in the clinical trial. Uh, you'll have to go over that with your own oncologist uh, to decide whether uh, that's the uh, instance uh, for you. And number three, one of the most important things that you'll need to know or have uh, to survive cancer 
is that you're going to need the support of your loved ones, family, and friends. And understand that they need to provide it as much as you need to have it. And don't underestimate their uh, capacities. Uh, I've often seen uh, each one of uh, the family members uh, of a patient uh, have their own uh, particular specialty. One um, might be uh, that that person who you know can provide um, the uh, emotional comfort that a patient needs. Uh, another uh, might uh, have a technical expertise that allows them to help that patient evaluate all of the possible treatment options uh, that are available and uh, sort through them, um, helping the patient uh, in, in that most critical way. And uh, sometimes it's uh, financial resources. Uh, very often, I'll see patients uh, come in with uh, their son, their uncle, their brother, who uh, has resources that allows them to pursue treatments that they uh, might not uh, be able uh, to pursue without that help. And uh, the relatives, friends, and loved ones need to be able to do this as well. Don't forget that they love you and they are dealing with your situation in a very personal way as well. And one of the ways they can help uh, them deal with it is to be helping you. So uh, overall, uh, you've got to have that support and you have to let them uh, give it to you. Number four, mobilize as many people to pray for you as possible. I've already discussed with you the uh, story of a patient that came to me many years ago, and he had a tumor in his liver that was uh, terminal and unresectable. And rather than go through the usual treatment, he had his church set up a prayer chain that went around the world for him. Remarkably, his tumor completely went away. And I had seen him five years later, and he still had uh, no active uh, cancer. This opened up uh, a, a major new world uh, for me. Uh, it was such a dramatic a demonstration of what uh, prayer could do that I had to start uh, thinking about it, considering it. And when I was uh, diagnosed with my own terminal prostate cancer, I was uh, determined to include a prayer as one of the major components of my approach to treatment. I produce a video with a number of good friends uh, and uh, we basically got tens of thousands of people to pray for me. Uh, along with uh, a treatment of my own design, um, I'm now two and a half years later with no uh, evidence uh, for cancer. I ask for a miracle and I got it. And so but to say that I'm a believer in prayer as a mode of a cancer management um, is a, a tremendous uh, understatement. There is a wonderful article by a pastor, Elms, uh, in the Huffington Post, which discusses intercessory prayer, or the intercession of, of prayer uh, for uh, healing. He relates the story of his 17-year-old daughter who was diagnosed with an astrocytoma. Astrocytomas, while they can be uh, 
partially removed, uh, are rarely uh, completely removed. And uh, he made prayer and the thousands of people who prayed for his daughter a uh, main component of uh, her journey to beat this cancer. Uh, she remained uh, free of cancer for seven years. In this article, Pastor uh, Elms talks about how prayer could possibly work. We are in a very exciting time. It is a time where science and spirituality are coming together. And science, rather than being the opponent of spirituality, as in, as in the usual empiricism of science, which said if you can't feel it, touch it, um, then uh, it can't be real. The new science of quantum physics, new being in the last oh, 100 years now, um, is uh, a support for how prayer uh, could logically and scientifically uh, create uh, its effect. You know, it's beyond the scope of this uh, talk, but uh, I would refer you to a wonderful book by Lynn McTaggart called The Field, where she talks about uh, the zero-point field, its quantum physical aspects, and how it is the substrate from which uh, many miraculous things can happen. Number five. Number five is really, I think, a corollary of uh, number four. And that is to find comfort in the understanding uh, that there is a higher power and that events are unfolding uh, as they should, even though it might be currently beyond our understanding of why things are what they are. Uh, I have a good friend who uh, had a grandson uh, that tragically died from childhood cancer. And their faith in that uh, he was in a better place and that even though they didn't understand why a loving God that they believe in would do this terrible thing to their lives. It was this acceptance that some godly things are beyond their understanding that uh, gave them a great comfort and that faith kept uh, that family together where if they didn't have that faith, uh, very often uh, it would end up in a family falling apart. There are two things that protect us when something bad happens um, in our lives. As Jordan Peterson uh, often says, uh, life is malevolent. And it's certain that we will face difficult uh, challenges. Very often that will be a cancer in ourselves or one of our lo loved ones. Uh, we all will eventually um, have a brush with, uh, you know, this most scary of uh, diseases. Peterson's remedy 
for this uh, is to have a purpose, have goals in your life. And uh, when these difficult things happen, if you have a purpose, uh, you have something to hold on to and keep uh, striving for. The second thing is faith. I uh, think of faith as uh, the airbag of life. When uh, a crash is coming, as it invariably will, faith can keep the damage uh, from being uh, incapacitating and uh, actually fatal. Along those lines, it helps to gain an understanding that there really is life uh, after death and that our consciousness uh, survives when our body dies. I refer you to the story of Eben Alexander that he outlines in his book, Proof of Heaven. In that a story, uh, Dr. Alexander, who's a neurosurgeon, gets a fatal brain infection, has no brain activity at all, and they're about to turn off his respirator when he wakes up and it, eventually has no sequela at all from a, an infection uh, of the brain that nobody's ever survived, let alone uh, survived without uh, any uh, sequela. And uh, he relates the story of his trip to heaven, in which he is exposed to uh, a download of knowledge that uh, uh, he can't even explain because it's uh, so extensive and has no words um, in uh, the English, English language or any language to, to relate to it. Uh, it's clear when you read the book that uh, this is a real phenomenon. He goes through all the scientific evidence for why what he experienced had to be what it was, and that there was no rational, known scientific explanation that could uh, fully explain his uh, experience. This became uh, the obviously most seminal instance in his life, and uh, became his mission from that point on to deliver the news that he was given. Uh, and I look upon him really as uh, what I would call a modern uh, day prophet. When I add his story with the information uh, about the quantum uh, basis for uh, these types of phenomenon uh, that I uh, already referenced in the field, you now have uh, what can be a coherent uh, foundation for uh, what we're talking about to include prayer uh, and to include uh, these uh, other uh, phenomena. This is not about getting ready to die. Uh, it's about lessening your anxiety. The patients that I've seen that do the best and that have uh, the least anxiety are those patients uh, with a faith. Why is that important? Because your anxiety and your mental processes have a direct effect on your immunology. And this is a field called psycho-oncology or psycho-neuroimmunology. And uh, it's established that 
Uh, cancer is a disease that's influenced by biological, but also psychological factors. So to have the best immunity possible, you have to have the least anxiety possible. And to have the least anxiety possible, faith uh, is uh, a, a critical component of that. Lastly, let me say that uh, it's, it's often been said that, you know, in a foxhole, there are no atheists. You might never have had uh, a faith, as we've talked about it. But then again, you've spent most of your life uh, pursuing worldly things. And, uh, you know, very often those faithful things can be put into uh, the background. Now that you or someone you know has cancer, it may be time to uh, explore uh, this most uh, important of subjects. Thank you very much. So this is the portion of the show where we uh, deal with uh, hope. And uh, we liken this portion to uh, present new trends in cancer treatment that are hopeful, as well as cancer statistics, and uh, anything that can we can look upon as a hopeful sign that down the line we're going to be better off in terms of uh, cancer treatment or diagnosis. So this uh, article or this piece of news comes from Medscape Medical News uh, by Pam Harrison, January 12th, 2022. So it is hot off the presses. Uh, basically, it states that the United States uh, has a decreased the risk of death from cancer overall, and it has been continuously dropping since 1991, as is noted in the American Cancer Society's latest report. So we're making progress. It's uh, inter incremental progress, uh, but definitely the trend is going in the right direction. So we can be very hopeful about that. There has been an overall decline of 32% in cancer deaths as of 2019, or approximately 3.5 million cancer deaths averted, the report notes. Wow. Um, that sounds like a big number. That must be worldwide, I would think. But, because um, I don't know how they're calculating that. But, um, uh, Definitely a significant number. The report states that this success is largely because of reductions in smoking that resulted in downstream declines in lung and other smoking-related cancers. So, stop smoking. Uh, that is probably one of the most important things you can do uh, for your overall health, besides decreasing your chance for cancer. And even if you've started smoking, what the statistics show is that each year your chances for getting lung cancer go down until about 10 years after you stop smoking, your risk becomes just like everybody else's. So uh, good, stop smoking uh, because it uh, makes your breath stink. And uh, there are a lot of uh, great potential spouses out there that won't even look at you if you're smoking. And uh, there is uh, lung disease, uh, emphysema, which is probably uh, the most ugly death that uh, anyone can uh, undergo. Uh, imagine that uh, you've just run a mile and you're short of breath. That is every moment of your life when you have emphysema. So, uh, great, stop smoking. The incidence of lung cancer uh, has declined by 3% per year in men between 2009 and 2018, and 1% uh, uh, in women. Currently, the historical large gender gap in lung cancer incidence is disappearing such that in 2018, Lung cancer rates were only 24% higher in men than they were in women, and rates in women were actually higher in some young age groups 
than they were in men. That's an interesting point. Uh, what's happening here? Um, men are probably stopping. Women uh, probably um, are not at the same rate, but the younger age groups uh, seem to be uh, greater affected. So maybe there's more smoking amongst uh, young women. Um, I don't know. I think the point to take away from this is that um, there are multiple factors that can affect a cancer rate. Number one is early diagnosis, which certainly has been a case in uh, lung cancer. Two is modifying the causes uh, of uh, the cancer. And number three is improving the treatment. The other thing I could say about lung cancer that should give you hope is that um, the newest treatment for lung cancer, which is uh, non-small cell lung cancer, that is, is uh, checkpoint inhibitors being uh, those immunologic. And we talk about checkpoint inhibitors all the time here because they're such an important advance in uh, oncology. but uh, I think the greatest hope is that the checkpoint inhibitors uh, have had a major impact on the uh, treatment of, of lung cancer and are constantly being improved upon with adding other drugs and, and lots of clinical trials on uh, lung cancer and how to improve it. So uh, there's hope for lung cancer. So we are to the portion of the show, The Mailbag, where uh, our uh, listeners get to ask us uh, questions about uh, cancer and how they're dealing with it on a spiritual as well as practical level. So the next question is Joe in Austin, Texas. The question is, I'm starting treatment for prostate cancer and my doctor has been rather blunt and unwilling to have conversations with me about alternative treatment. I would like to find a new doctor, but I'm very intimidated after my initial experience. Do doctors with better soft skills exist? And if so, how do you find them? It's a very good question. Um, I think the first point is that uh, particularly with prostate cancer, where uh, there are so many alternative treatments and the treatments that are reasonable for each patient are very different based on the kind of cancer the patient has. You know, for instance, if a patient has a very bad cancer, uh, what we call a high Gleason score, a very aggressive type cancer, uh, strangely enough, surgery for that person is less likely to cure them. And so uh, you want to look at uh, alternative treatments even uh, closer in uh, that situation. The second point is that if your doctor is unwilling to have conversations with you about uh, the various options that no, not only he wants to talk to about, uh, to you, but uh, what you want to talk about, then um, you have to find a new doctor because this is not someone that you want negotiating your care with you um, through the many uh, slings and arrows that you're going to have to deal with when you're going through a cancer. How do you find uh, a doctor that uh, suits you better? Well, uh, ask your friends. A personal uh, recommendation is probably one of the best ways of uh, finding out that there is a doctor who uh, might be more amenable to the way you want to be treated. Uh, as a person, as well as a patient. The other thing you can do is test doctors out. You may have to go to a few 
before you find one that you're comfortable with. What I can tell you is this. It is critically important that you're with somebody that you feel is your advocate and that is uh, compatible with the way you look upon your world. If you would like to ask us a question, you can go to garyonicmd.com. There is a contact form that you can fill out and it will send us your question and hopefully we'll be able to answer it on the air. Thank you for listening to our podcast. I hope that it provided you with some useful information, some hope, and some comfort. Thank you very much.